Well, I will not mention cement during this panel. <laughs> uh, great day. Learned a whole lot here today. I hope uh, you did as well. Uh, we're going to finish up with uh, uh, my, my involvement here with a couple of people, uh, Steele, who I've just met, Bob, who's uh, up until uh, yesterday was a COVID buddy. But now we've ruined it. We've met in person. Uh, but now you can hear a little bit about the application of so many of the things we heard today uh, in terms of the macro picture and the micro picture, where it all happens, where it really intersects. And as you uh, might guess from the introduction, Steele is in a very interesting business. I'll ask him to tell you a little bit about it. But he grew up in a community that's known for agriculture in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where they grow cheese. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, after school, he went and did a very interesting project in India, which I think he'll tell us a little bit about. And he learned it's not really easy to build businesses in a developing economy, especially in the agriculture world. But now he understands the ag world and its applications from a very different perspective in his work at uh, Farmers Business Network. And Bob Jones uh, is from uh, Ohio. Uh, the, his family has a six-generation farm on the shores of Lake Erie in, in a very interesting microclimate. And on, on that farm, they grow some ducks. No, on that farm, they grow vegetables. <laughs> and the vegetables are the best vegetables you've ever tasted or seen in your life. And they've been so successful at the Jones Family Farm, which they call uh, Chef's Garden. Uh, and the name will give you an idea of what happened to their business over the years. They grew such an extraordinary product uh, that the best chefs in the best restaurants in the country, and in fact, the world, were clamoring to get their product. Now, these are people who really know how to work with that product and were dying to get it. And so their business migrated to 100 customers around the country, which were the finest restaurants, as their only customers. They would buy everything that the farm could produce, which was a great thing until this COVID thing came along and all those restaurants closed. And that's how Bob and I got to know one another. We were introduced by a mutual friend. And Bob said, the good news is I went direct to the consumer. The bad news is I sold only a million dollars worth of product, but I still grow $18 million worth of product. Can you help us? As you may know, we have a brand called Harry and David, which is a terrific gift company in the food business. We sell a lot of pears and apples and peaches and kiwis and grapes. Oh my, and a lot of other things that we grow ourselves. But we, didn't, we don't grow vegetables. And so, we just, uh, so the interaction that Bob and I had gave us the idea that we should change our model and have partners who feel like we do, have the values we do, have the agricultural practices that we admire, respect, and do. And let's be a, a direct marketing arm for the Jones Family Farm Chef's Garden. And that's where we are today. So let me ask you, Steele, tell us a little bit about your business and the macro picture. And who do you serve? How many farms do you work with? How many, how, what kind of acreage does that produce? And I think particularly interesting when we hear about agriculture is how that agricultural mix breaks down in terms of food products at all. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Farmers Business Network started as a ag technology platform that allowed farmers to share information about how they farm and what they farm uh, for the purposes of benchmarking off of each other and collectively finding ways that they could improve uh, from an agronomic perspective, uh, looking at uh, things like seeding rate, uh, what is the successful plant population um, and what uh, maximizes yield for a specific you know, type of soil. Uh, specific type of growing conditions um, from an uh, economic standpoint, uh, allowing growers to share uh, the price of inputs, uh, what they're seeing, uh, what they're able to negotiate, uh, and then also, of course, uh, what they're able to uh, sell for. Um, all of those things are uh, largely very asymmetrical in, in the um, understanding that an individual grower might have selling to a much larger, or larger organization. And so that was the, the genesis of our platform. So you had all this kind of data, yep. and you provided transparency to help farmers understand that maybe the seed that they were going to buy would be better if they bought the generic version of it. Yeah, exactly. So it uh, grew very quickly um, based on that. Growers were quite interested in the analytics that we were able to provide uh, from the data that they shared with us. Um, did a couple of things that made us pretty um, uh, well known in the industry. One was a seed relabeling report uh, where we showed that, in fact, different genetics that farmers were buying uh, were, or different brands that they were buying for different price points were, in fact, the same genetics, um, which made them... Uh, 
uh, pretty angry at retailers and, and pretty happy with us. Uh, but you made them smarter. You made them smarter, right? But it was their data. They should yes. have known this, right? Yeah. Uh, we just provided the analytics for it. Um, and uh, the other thing that we provided was an analytics on uh, price transparency, which uh, for those of you that might be um, that might know retail and in, in agriculture, uh, pretty different price points for farmers, even for the same product, depending on uh, what you negotiate, what your relationship might be. And so uh, being able to provide that information made us uh, not only uh, a good friend of the farmer, but uh, rapidly resulted in them asking if they could just buy those things from us. And so from a platform where we offered transparency, we pretty, pretty, we, uh, pretty rapidly became uh, the largest e-commerce provider of crop protection and seed uh, in, the, in North America. And now you're doing insurance? And now we are the fourth largest crop insurance provider in the U.S. Um, and we're the fastest growing farm finance uh, organization um, in the U.S. as well. So uh, all of that based on a, a strong uh, uh, commitment to ag data transparency and making sure that everything that we did uh, resulted in value for growers, not value for uh, downstream market players. And how many farms are in your program? Uh, we have about 100 million acres, uh, 60,000 growers on the platform today. And one of those growers is, is a fellow by the name of Jones. Bob, uh, your family farm, you grow vegetables. As I mentioned, six generations. The most recent is a recently graduated two that came uh, back into the business because uh, you have a rule in your family that they can't graduate school and come to work in a business right away. Right. That was something that my father instituted uh, several years ago that the next generation couldn't come back into the business. They could work during summers of high school or college. We'd Not could, some. they had to. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it, but they couldn't come back in a meaningful management capacity and, until they had had at least an undergraduate degree and three years work experience when, with someone else, bring back a skill set we don't have. Our farm family's mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, to care for each other and the land, and to inspire a vegetable forward future. Uh, it's been I very, can see the t-shirts now. <laughs> grow, care, inspire. Yeah. And now, uh, I've heard you say this, Bob, and, uh, and it just rings true because people will see the passion and knowledge that you have. But you're, the most important asset you have isn't the brand, isn't the product you produce. It's, it's the people and the soil. The, we grow 800 crops, 800 different edible varieties of plants. Uh, but the most important crop we grow is our soil. And that's aided by greatly by regenerative agriculture, which is a buzzword today. It's something that we learned about about 15 years ago and have been learning about ever since and continue to learn. Uh, healthy soils grow healthy crops, healthy people, healthy planet. Tell us uh, uh, what you do. You have a, how many acres is the farm? 400 acres in total which is an enormous vegetable farm, but you only use about a third of it at a time. Why? A third of it is in vegetables each season, and then the other two thirds are, on, are uh, in multi-species cover crop. And that is designed specifically to build the health of the soil from a mineral aspect, from a biological aspect, uh, to accentuate natural processes that, that will grow great tasting and nutrient dense food. You'll, you'll understand and appreciate this deal, but uh, I, I, I like broccoli. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you'll never forget that. <laughs> but I like asparagus better. But anyway, broccoli. Uh, the broccoli we buy today looks so nice, good color. Tell me about the nutrient value in that broccoli today versus maybe something I had uh, maybe didn't eat when I was growing up. USDA tells us today that you need to consume three times the amount of broccoli today that you did in 1950 to receive the same nutritive value. So the health of the soils has gone down uh, greatly and the, then obviously the, the health of that plant has gone down to where it's now verified scientifically that you have to eat three times as much broccoli as you did uh, 70 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, except if it comes from your farm. Uh, tell me about the different kinds of cover crop that you use, and do you get into cover crop seeds and, for different applications? I think you have a couple of dozen different kinds of cover crops you're rotating all the time, Bob? Go for it. Um, yes, we have about 30 different species of cover crop, 
and we put together what we call cover crop cocktails of different five, 10, 15 different species of plants. And it's now uh, gotten to the level where it depends on what the crop that's going to, the vegetable crop that will go in that land subsequently determines what the species of cover crop go on that fallow land for that previous year in anticipation. An example, um, hairy vetch or field peas or field soybeans that are uh, building nitrogen in the soil naturally will go in ahead of a tomato crop the following year because they are a high nitrogen user. We don't add nitrogen and phosphorus to our soils anymore because two to three times the amount of phosphorus we need to grow any crop we grow exists in our soils naturally. We call it legacy minerals. It just has to be untapped. And the only way to do that is to uh, build the biological life within the soil and convert those legacy minerals to a form that the plant can then use in a subsequent crop. It's all very, very old technology. It's what we've grown away from in our desire to increase yields. Um, and it's just we've gone so far past that. And what we're really trying to do is to become as good a growers as our grandparents were. That's, that's incredible. What, what does that mean for your bottom line? Sorry, I'm not to, trying no, to no, steal please. your job, but like to not apply nitrogen. Hey, would you be quiet for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I nerd out about this stuff. <laughs> uh, but I, the, to not apply nitrogen must make it uh, substantially more profitable if you can do that. There's work done. First of all, before I forget to mention this, Kiss the Ground is a wonderful documentary if you have not seen it. it explains the climate problem that we have in agriculture and the, the, the devastation we face if we don't change very quickly. There's another uh, documentary, has not been released yet, called Food and Country. Food and Country was done by Ruth Reichel and Laura Gabbert. Uh, and my brother and I were included in that documentary. And they talk about the food uh, marketplace um, and how it has evolved over the years and not necessarily in a good way. Uh, Christine Jones out of Australia, soil scientist, did work many years ago that when you get to 15 to 20 species of, of cover crop in one field, you can actually produce 200 pounds of organic nitrogen per acre by the synergistic effect of the plants and the root exudates. Every leaf of every plant that we grow is a simple solar panel. We've heard a lot about solar today. I plant solar fields. Hmm. Multi-species cover crop, capturing light energy, photosynthesis, chemical energy. Plants use about 50% of the energy they produce. The rest is, ex is exuded into the soil to feed the microbiology in the soil if it is present, if we haven't killed it. Diversity is key. That's why monocropping doesn't work. Monoculture is one species over thousands of acres and you get a void of biological life in the soil. All of that biology lends towards nutritional density and flavor, which is what chefs have demanded of us for over 40 years. Steele, uh, with the, the seat you have at the table and you get to see what's going on across those 100 million acres and those 60,000 farmers that you work with, tell us something that you think is we will, when we convene here again three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, let's, a big trend that you think is is coming about? Well, I know we talked about one back in the green room, but um, uh, being inspired by Bob here, I think I would will change my answer. Uh, would, whoa, would whoa, have, whoa, 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 I'm, whoa. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out here. <laughs> what you have done bringing yourself close to the consumer is the the dream of, of, of many farmers that I think that I've talked to and-, and uh, To know their end customer. Uh, yeah, uh, to be able to, and to be able to talk about true value, which in this case is, yeah. is nutrients and flavor, right? That's, uh, there is a huge demand for that. What stands in the way of that is uh, a lot of growers are doing uh, commodity crops. And so it, a lot of that, uh, even if you have a, a nutrient dense uh, crop, uh, it it's, uh, changes many hands many times, uh, it's processed many times. Uh, what I see coming in the next five years is the ability to uh, 
uh, see through the supply chain uh, for a grower to be able to say, I am doing these specific practices, I'm achieving these specific outcomes, might be for flavor and nutrient density, might be for uh, carbon reduction, uh, reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the technology is rapidly coming online to be able to do that. Um, so I, I think that that is going to be one of the core opportunities uh, for consumers yeah, downstream to be able it's to It's evidence do. of a movement, and I, certainly we feel it here in this room. Tell me, how does the, the crops that you cover break down? Which food products versus... Yeah, so uh, in the U.S., uh, 30 to 40 percent of crops are going to uh, animal feed, 30 to 40 percent going to biofuel, and the balance going uh, to be processed for for food uh, directly. And so I was shocked by that. I, I would have thought it was so much more food. Yeah, as we think about the real levers uh, from a market standpoint uh, for baking in climate um, uh, improvements or climate uh, uh, incentives, um, biofuels and animal feed have to be uh, at the forefront um, in, unless uh, you know we make some of the changes that were talked about here today and in, in changing the total amount of, of uh, agriculture that would go into those products. But uh, near term, um, given the economic system that we have and, and the demand for those things. I it's, was... it's behavioral. If you reinforce and pay for something here, that's what you're going to get. Uh, you know, We talked about the example of broccoli and the less nutrient value it has today. Tell us, uh, Bob, you're doing a lot of work with, uh, with different universities on food as medicine. And you wowed me with uh, data on, on uh, a couple of different vegetables that you're actually making vegetable cocktails as medicine? Um, I, I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm not a physician, but I know... But you did you. stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> right. Um, but I'm working with a holistic oncologist, a gal by the name of Dr. Nasha Winters, uh, Metabolic Terrain Institute for Health, and a cardiologist and a microbiologist on gut health. And to the, for the most part, what I understand is that most human disease today has its root cause in a mineral deficiency. USDA, again, says 40% uh, or 70% less nutrition in the last 60 years, um, and so you have to eat more, and we have obese people dying of malnutrition in our country. Uh, USDA also says that by October of 23, we, the United States will be a net food importer. That's a national security issue. Um, the doctors are saying, we need these specific compounds that are within the broccoli. And so we have come up with different crops, uh, in, specifically in microgreens. Um, broccoli and radish combined when chewed and swallowed, you can't, you can't uh, blend it, you can't uh, juice it, you have to consume it, you have to chew it. Saliva in our mouths break that down and then into the gut, you form sulforaphane, which is a natural chemoprotectant, which is an amazing thing. Food is really medicine if we do it right. And, and you, uh, with the work that you're doing there, you cannot take that if you're on chemo. You can't take it if, on, if you're on chemo. You have to go between rounds of chemo. It also doesn't work if you use mouthwash, uh, or at least not as efficiently, because you're killing all the bacteria in your mouth where those original bacteria are formed. If you're a habitual um, antibiotic user, it doesn't work. And if you use a lot of antacids, you change the pH in the gut and the chemistry doesn't work as well. So there, it's all accentuating natural processes, yep. understanding them, leveraging them to work for you instead of against you. Anytime we can work with nature instead of against nature, we win. As you can see, uh it ain't just farming. There's a lot that goes into it in terms of the soil science, the data, the analytics, the, uh, the uh, pr rotation of products, crops, etc. It's a lot to learn. Now, the last thing I'll tell you is if you're nice to Bob, and I particularly mean you, Steele, <laughs> if you're nice to Bob at the uh, uh, little reception afterwards, you might get invited because I did. Uh, in May, we're going out uh, to, uh, to Ohio uh, because it's asparagus harvest season. And they grow the most amazing asparagus on, at the Chef's Garden Farm. And uh, we're going to go out and harvest some asparagus. And then if you happen to be a small commercial, Harry and David owns the Food of the Month Club and the Vegetable of the Month Club. And you're looking at the head of the family that provides our vegetable of the month. And uh, in May, it's going to be asparagus. And you have several different kinds of asparagus we'll be shipping in May. Green, purple, pink, and white. And uh, uh, I heard a couple of French accents in the audience, and I know the French 
We'll love white asparagus. So be especially nice at the reception. Thanks so much for your time, and thank you for your time and wisdom, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.